Welcome to Psychedelics Today with your host Kyle and Joe. Today we are here with our guest Neil Goldsmith. Neil is a psychotherapist, author, public speaker, specializing in psychospiritual development with a particular expertise in psychedelic psychotherapy. Neil is also the author of the book Psychedelic Healing, The Promise of Entheogens for Psychotherapy and Spiritual Development. Neil is the host of the annual Horizons Perspective on Psychedelics Conference in New York City, which is actually coming up uh, pretty soon in October 7th to the 9th. Um, welcome to yeah. the show, Neil. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, we'll just kind of jump right in and maybe ask you about your background. How did you get into the psychedelic world? And <laughs> Well, the background is actually a little convoluted. Most backgrounds are convoluted, actually, with professional right. backgrounds. <laughs> you know, I, I, my master's degree is actually in counseling psychology. And in, to get that master's, we were trained not just in psychological counseling, which was my specialty, but also um, what they called agency counseling, which was uh, um, uh, occupational or educational counseling as well. So I learned a little bit about occupational counseling. One of the things I learned was that people go through, I think it was an average of three and a half careers in their lifetime, not just job changes, but actual changes in career. And that's been the case with me. So as far as my background is concerned, I already mentioned, you know, I had that um, that counseling um, masters. And then I got interested in, um, for a variety of reasons, got interested in the impact of organizations and policy and the role of research in finding out the best of what is known. And then, you know, um, so I went to a research program really at the doctoral level. Um, and when I got into the research program, I started looking at research utilization. You know, it was sort of calling into question the whole efficacy of the, of the graduate program I was in. Do these results, does this research actually get implemented into policy and later into practice. And so I did that dissertation on research utilization and then got hired into a um, AT&T, my, my first profession. I, I did a postdoc at Princeton. And then uh, from there, I was hired into AT&T um, to do internal consulting on technology transfer, which is kind of like research utilization. Mm. And, you know, after doing that for a while and being, you know, having the best job in, in, in the world, really, it was a, a artificial intelligence and emerging technology and internal consulting on people who were resisting change. You know, it was interesting and sexy and engaging, and I really hated it um, <laughs> because I, I was working. It was, the, it was the best job you could have in corporate America, from my perspective, at least, given the person, the, the person who I was. But um, it was corporate America. And once I started taking psychedelics again, when I was in my early 40s, um, I started just realizing, seeing things differently, of course, and realizing that uh, although it was a great job, it was really, I was helping, by that point I was at American Express Company, helping in the strategic planning department, doing technology strategy, really sexy job. But at that point I was helping American Express pick our pockets ever more effectively. Mm. And so I uh, went out on my own. <clears throat> and I decided to reopen my clinical practice. First they did some consulting and then you know, I was so passionate about the psychedelics, and by that point, I'd been in corporate America, I'd done all this other stuff, and I, you know, I could do a pretty good PowerPoint, you know, and I could do a pretty good <laughs> presentation, and I was, I was, you know, well-schooled, or um, uh, what's the word, like, just uh, groomed, in a way, to do, you know, formal work and get up in public and do consulting or research and things like that, and so, but I started now applying it to, to the world of psychedelics, mm -hmm. and it turned out that my interest in research utilization um, that I'd done as a dissertation topic, uh, and that had been picked up by my supervisor at at t who hired me in to do technology transfer, which is kind of like research utilization. That research utilization background became totally relevant again once I was uh, focused on psychedelics, because, of course, psychedelics is probably the most egregious example of a lack of research utilization, <laughs> right. you know, right. being transferred, translated into policy and then practice. There's lots of resistance to change. And um, so many psychological and social psychological issues, cultural issues. It's fascinating. So, you know, not that I could do what I had been doing in corporate in the psychedelics world, because there's not a lot of money left for consulting or things like that. But certainly my um, the conference that I do, the Horizons Conference, which comes up, by the way, every uh, Columbus Day weekend. So it'll be October 7th through 9th this week, this week, this year, I should say, um, in, uh, in New York City. And it's horizonsnyc.org. If you're interested, please come. But, you know, that's an example of research utilization of, of policy implementation uh, efforts. And, uh, you know, the book itself is, is also like that as well. So I'm still doing research utilization and policy change, but just in a different way and uh, in, in an area that I'm very passionate about that I love. Mm -hmm. Did you have any major influences 
um, or, or mentors in the whole psychedelic transition? Well, I mean, it's, it's hard. That's hard to say, really. Right. There's so many mentors. Mentors, no. I don't think I, I'm, I'm not a mentor, mentee kind of person, usually. Sure. Um, so it's not been like that. But in terms of reading and, you know, um, becoming familiar with people's work, it's everybody in a way. I hate to wimp out on the question, but it's like <laughs> everybody's had their influence. I'm really agnostic, mm-hmm. not agnostic, but ecumenical about um, how about about the influence of people. It, it, schools of thought, for example, there's behaviorism, there's Freudian, there's, you know, there's all these different schools of thought. They're all correct. Religions, the same thing. You know, Christianity, Buddhism, whatever. They're all right. They're all correct. And of course, they're all correct because in their niches, they're correct, like behaviorism and Freudianism when applied to the appropriate application area really work. You know, they, they've been tried and true over the, over the, you know, over the decades. Um, and with religion, too, it's like when they, um, you know, there's really only one reality, right? It, it's just the, the underneath the buzzing, blooming, underlying, you know, quantum reality that's, that's there, the spiritual world out of which the material world kind of precipitates like raindrops out of a cloud of vapor. Um, it changes phase, and, and, and so now we have the physical world. But the underlying spiritual world or quantum world or you know whatever you want to call it, really, that underlying thing, that essence of the universe, the, that is the same thing that everybody looks at. Be you a poet or a philosopher or a physicist or a religious person, um, we're all looking deeply at the same underlying thing. And we use different metaphors and different language a different training, different worldview, perspective, biases even, you know, to describe what we're seeing. And those who get, you know, really clear and mature, whatever word you want to use on that one, um, recognize, I think, that there's one beautiful underlying reality and that um, Mm. it's not a a matter of science versus religion or even mind versus brain or, uh, you know, spirituality versus um, uh, pharmacology. Uh, it's not what it's about. There's only one thing. And those dualities are welcome in a way, because when you see a duality, you always know that neither side is going to win the argument and that transcendence and integration um, is the answer to all dualities. Mm-hmm. So you, know, you see a duality between matter and spirit, for example. No, 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 no. There's only one thing. That's why, that's why in physics they call it a wave call. Is it a wave? <laughs> is it a particle? You know, is it spirit? Is it material? And the answer to that duality is yes. Right. It's one. It's a third thing that we're not really quite in touch with yet. Um, that that umbrellas both uh, extremes. Mm. So influences. You asked me. Yeah, there's a jillion influences in a way. They're all influences. Um, I like uh, in psychology. I like Assajoli, uh, Roberto Assajoli. He did mm. uh, psychosynthesis. Um, yeah. I like. Um, um, oh jeez. Um, my one of my favorite influences is. Um, so Sandor Ferenzi, that's another disciple of Freud. He was a, he was a love oriented, um, uh, psychologist. And then of course there's all sorts of psychedelic, um, authors, uh, that I love. Mostly I'm looking at the transcendent types of folks, the ones who, who aren't really focused in so much on one approach, like physiology or something, but you know, there's room for everything. Um, I like Huxley a lot. Aldous Huxley is a hero of mine. Um, I'll stop before I go too far. <laughs> right. The transcendent, that's a pretty big list in this field. Well, it is indeed. And, um, you know, there's one, there's one philosopher who I really like a lot. Um, I'm just trying to think of this. Um, yeah. I like Almas a lot. Mm. Almas, A-L-M-A-A-S. He wrote ex- uh, Essence. Um, he, you see, he talks about the diamond approach. I really like that a lot. Um, I did have actually a mentor in um, uh, Swami Alan Ajaya, who is a psychologist uh, who went to India in the 1970s and helped found uh, the Himalayan Institute when he came back to the States. Um, and he's wonderful. He wrote a book called Psychotherapy East and West that I really like. Hmm. Um, you know, I, like I like Stuart Kaufman. Um, he's an evolutionary biologist. And he talks. he has a book called The Origins of Order that I really like. Uh, Jonathan Ott. I really admire. He's very um, OTT. He's wonderful. He wrote a book called Pharmacotheon, which mm. is excellent. Uh, there's many, many, many. Oh, <laughs> Sheldrake. You... Let's not forget Rupert Sheldrake. 
the rebirth of nature, the greening of science and God. Mm-hmm. And there you go, the opposition, right? Again, science and God, the greening of science and God. And then, of course, the, the Shulgans. Right. So, very, yeah, Shulgans are very influential. Yeah. What are your uh, thoughts about Groff? By the way, Shulgin is influential for me because um, not because of his chemistry, which I admire and am so eternally grateful for him to create a little <laughs> interesting materials into the world, as we all are. But what I liked about Sasha, the thing that really influenced me about him was his kick-ass attitude towards science and towards society. Um, you know, he was he pointed out ridiculous things like there was a law, the Analog Drug, Drug Act, that says that anything that is substantially similar <laughs> to an already scheduled substance is in itself scheduled. So what does that mean? S- similar in chemistry, similar in experience, pharm- you know, behaviorally, pharmacologically. You know, it was, and he would point, he ridiculed that, for example. So he ridiculed hypocrisy and, um, and uh, he, he was just such a wonderful kind of, his approach to science and, and chemistry and policy and, and drug laws was um, iconoclastic. And we could use some more knocking down of I th- icons. I think it was really influential philosophically, too, like that whole um, our science is really young. So we can't really speak metaphysically yeah. much <laughs> from a scientific origin. I thought that kind of approach was really neat and needed. Yeah, he's, he was wonderful. I got to see him at um, the Horizons uh, he was at forever ago. Oh, good. Yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, that was quite a while. Um, cool. So let's see. Uh, we were, yeah, we were going to ask about Groff. Um, have you, have you had oh, a chance Groff. to meet or work with Groff or try breath work? Mm-hmm. No, I haven't done any of those things actually, although I've, I've tried breath work. Yes. Um, but I haven't met Groff or worked with him now. You know, Groff, um, is a towering figure because of his, his, um, really tireless efforts to do the research, especially in the early days. I mean, you know, when he was in Czechoslovakia, he spent a decade doing nothing but psychedelics research. Right. He ran, you know, hundreds, if not, I think thousands actually, of, of psychedelic uh, sessions. So his experience is extraordinary. Now, personally, you know, I'm more, like philosophically, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like more Zen oriented. I want to get to emptiness, to right. oneness. You know, I want to solve duality and get to the unity. That sort of thing I want to transcend. So, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm more interested in going inside to the quiet center. Um, and Groff and Jung, Carl Jung is another one that's sort of similar in a way, that are vo- both very, very vibrantly um, archi- archetypical, very much interested in the sort of... Um, uh, manifestation of pure consciousness into a specific role or event or fear or experience. Um, and so they, you know, Groff worked with that sort of thing. It, you know, the scatological drawings, for example, from his books show how much energy there is, how much blood and war. And, you know, that was the transition that he focused a lot on because it was the most dramatic. Personally, it's not exactly my approach. My approach is more to um, breathe to go inside, to find the nexus, the knot in your psychological muscle, if mm-hmm. you will, caused in, in, in your early childhood by trauma or deficit. Deficit, you know, coldness can cause a knot in your, in your muscle just as much as a blow. And so that knot deep down inside of us is what we need to go to, and psychedelics are a helpful tool to illuminate and to give a sense of okayness so that we can go there and release that heavily defended knot in our psychological muscle. But yes, the process of the throughput process of releasing will sometimes result in, you know, uh, uh, violence and death and fear and blood and that sort of thing. However, that to me is not the um, process. That's the resistance to the process. Hmm. It's kind of like when you're tripping, you know, if you uh, go with the flow and release this, the, 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 the action of the drug itself, uh, so let's say LSD, for example, is illuminative. It's um, not uh, crazy, uh, wacky, hallucinatory, you know, emotional, uptight. Those are all reactions to the action of psychedelics. Mm. And the same thing with Groff. The, all the tense, you know, graphic, violent, you know, bloody images are the reaction to the action, that they're go- the process they're going through. The process they're going through is release, surrender, mm. unfurling unknotting, if you will, you know, releasing the, the knot. And so um, 
I'm more focused, you know, I don't, I don't like to, like sometimes with my clients, for example, they'll go through something, they'll be telling me about, you know, somebody I know reasonably well, and they'll start to tell me about an example of something about, they get uptight about, you know, authority figures, let's just say. And I know this because they've described it many times. And so now they're in my office and they're talking about how this happened to them this week. And they start getting, and then he started this, and then he, and they're getting very upset, very upset, not, not upset exactly, it's just energized, you know, tense. And I, I feel myself getting tense. I take a deep breath. I say, wait a minute, hold on. Let me interrupt you. I said, actually, you know, it's not necessary to go there again. I know just what you're referring to. Why wear the pathway any deeper? I get mm-hmm. it. Let's go the opposite direction. Let's try to release and, you know, let's try to get to a safe space. Let's think about love. Let's um, understand that through the use of psychedelics sometimes that, you know, we, we see that the fundamental nature of things is really okay. And that the tension and the anxiety or the depression or whatever comes from our personality that we acquired in childhood and that personality in its interaction with society today. So, you know, um, uh, you're not going to solve that problem by trying to fix the fight you had with your grocery store clerk yesterday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> You're going to fix that one by going back to the authority figure and, you know, in your, your early childhood parent usually and trying to see that with compassion and open to seeing it with adult eyes, if you will, mm-hmm. because we, we, you know, personality is a strategy. It's a strategy devised by a two year old or a one year old. It's often preverbal for that matter. It's, it's the child's attempt to get air sats love, to make a devil's bargain, to keep themselves safe in interaction with the parent. That's personality. It's a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it kind of works when you're a kid, but then when you get out of the house and you're in the real world where people don't act that way, it doesn't work anymore. And so then the task of adulthood, really, of transitioning from childhood to adulthood, the task really is to recognize, to allow yourself to see what the, 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 the strategy, the acquired defense, the external strategic thing that you did, we call personality, in interaction with your parents. And to see that while it was necessary when you were one or two, it's no longer necessary because now you're 30 or 40 or whatever, and now you're strong. So now mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if your parents yell at you or abandon you or all the things you were scared of, mortally, appropriately scared of when you were one or two. Those things are no longer fearful anymore. So you can release personality, which was meant to help the, the baby because it's no longer necessary. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. <clears throat> um, I just kind of want to go back to that idea of resistance, like these archetypal themes, and you're bringing up the resistance topic. Um, Joe and I uh, both do breath work and, it, it, you yeah. know, it's kind of like that cathartic release. Um, and I'm thinking about some of the experiences that I've had, of maybe having a cathartic release of like a childhood experience and then realizing, oh, that was a defense yeah. mechanism. I don't need that anymore. Um, would you say that you're not uh, about the cathartic release? Is that still resistance or... Mm. Uh, I'm not sure I see exactly the connection because I do favor, you know, I, I am in favor of catharsis. Um, okay. However, I believe it needs to kind of be combined with or ins- interspersed with a sense of um, safety right. or love mm-hmm. uh, or relax, release or bliss, if you will. So that, you know, I, I write about it in my book how I had, you know, the, the, the book is kind of bookended, if you will, by two different psychedelic experiences that I had. Um, one of which was sort of more transcendent oriented. But mm-hmm. the problem was the issues kind of kept coming back. Right. Transcending didn't really eliminate. And then later on, toward the end of the book, there's a second experience, which is more transcendent. I mean, uh, more cathartic. Mm-hmm. And that one really did finish the job up, so to speak. You know? But well, I couldn't have done that one. I couldn't have been relaxed enough and trusting and loving and understanding enough about the way that I worked and the way things work to do that if I hadn't had that earlier transcendent, blissful, loving experience. So they kind of are in, in, in interplay, in, um, right. in tandem, the two work together. So, um, you know, catharsis without, um, you know, uh, uh, bliss or, 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 or a good feeling or love, let's say love and safety. Catharsis without love and safety is really horrific, can be horrific. Like ego death really can be potentially horrific. But then, mm-hmm. you know, um, bliss or love, um, uh, safety is, is just like a, a palliative. It doesn't last. So you have to keep coming back and doing it again. It's like a drug. So right. that's no good either. So you use both together in a dance, um, mm. holistic, you know, dance. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, 
I'm doing, I'm studying somatic psychology and some of these newer somatic techniques, um, to help with like trauma and whatnot, you know, they criticize some of these more primal techniques, um, w oh. that involve catharsis. And then, um, I think some of the newer ones Why? embody like kind of like that Zen mentality of like, just, you know, oh. a calm, a calm approach. See, that's what I meant. That when mm -hmm. I said I was ecumenical on how they all work, right. you know, these people, I theorists, I hate this stuff. <laughs> people get involved in a certain school of thought or a movement. It gets sociological. It right. gets, you know, they want to be first or best, or they want to protect their, their logo or the logos, their, um, their, you know, their dogma. And, um, it's, um, it's, it's ridiculous really in a way it's immature and it's, it's not true. So, you know, if they're, you know, why would you, the catharsis has its place, obviously. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't want to say obvious because that doesn't prove anything really. But to me, it's self-evident, I guess, that that every, I, I should say, not catharsis per se, but every approach, you know, that's, that's tried and true, you know, that's, that's made it through the decades or the centuries. Even, you know, something that works, that seems to work. I, my attitude is if, if it's lasted for a while and lots of people b believe in it, then if you do it sincerely, um, diligently with sincere, you know, guidance or teaching, then you'll make progress. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only, you know, thing you might have to work on. Almas, one of the things I liked about Almas, his book, um, um, uh, Elixir, was that um, he talks about the true guru is someone who knows when to send you to another guru. <laughs> and so oh, like I've that. taught you all this stuff for 10 years, and now you need to learn such and such. And I'm really not the best person. The person is three mountains over. Is, mm. you know, guru so-and-so, go to him, work with him for another three or four years, and then come back to me and we'll take your next step. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really cool and selfless, kind of very mature. Mm -hmm. So schools of thought are sort of like that. I think that there's, a, there's a, you know, I think they're all correct in a way, um, in their own place, in their own appropriate zone. And that means that if they're all correct, then there's some transcendent um, integral overview kind of perspective or truth in which, you know, and that's, that's, I guess, just reality, you know, the way life works, that different things would come up in a, in a mosaic way, in an integrated, you know, way. Mm. Otherwise it's oppositional. Then, you, you know, it's, um, us against them and it becomes sociological, which is not about, um, about, uh, happiness nor truth. Right. Yeah, I've been noticing that that's some conversations that I've been having with uh, some of my teachers um, that in, in this field, particularly with the somatics, like people are trying to hold on to certain techniques and this one's better than that one. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah, yeah, it seems like we need to move towards it. It's a true. Certain things are going to be better than other things in mm -hmm. certain application areas. And eventually, like a thousand years from now, when we've done all the research you need to do, you know, <laughs> then we'll know exactly when to apply this or when to apply that. And under mm -hmm. the circumstances, what's appropriate, you know, that's kind of fanciful, but it, it, conceptually, though. by the way, are you familiar with the Hakomi approach? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not interested you, but I, I like that approach myself. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I was I'd like to learn more about the, it. Um, I'm not too familiar with it. I've read a little bit of uh, Kurt's book, but that's where I got that sense of uh, not having a cathartic experience. It seems like that one's more based in uh, trauma release. That's not necessarily, it, it, it oh, seems a little right. bit more calm, like a calmer approach, a little bit more sensitive. Right. As opposed approach. to rolfing, for example, right. or rolfing right. or Feldenkrais, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I would like to, if, if I had a jillion dollars, I would get some big building and each floor would do a different thing. And one <laughs> would be spiritual and be psychedelic and one would be physiological and there'd be different, you know, like a research institute or a therapy institute where you had also, it's, it's, I don't do physical, I don't do body work, but clearly there's a need for body work. Some of my clients come in here, they really, you know, it's obvious to me. I refer them out. Mm -hmm. So it's appropriate. Nobody can do everything, but you know, the whole person, like if I was real more, more uh, possessive or, um, you know, defensive about it, I'd say, no, no, you know, just like sit here, we'll get to it eventually. It'll work. But uh, you have to recognize, um, what's best for the client really. And so, you know, there's like this, um, this maturity is really the expansion of sort of the, the decrease in egocentrism. We in the sixties, they said, um, consciousness raising or consciousness expansion. Mm -hmm. um, expansion. And so, you know, if you think about it, baby, it's just about me, you know, and then it's me and mommy's breast, really. And then it's me and mommy, me and mommy and daddy, me and the rest of my family, me and my neighborhood, me and my school. As you get older, you know, me and my country, I'll go to war. 
mm-hmm. me and my planet, I'm focused on ecology, me, on, me and the universe. So I'm focused on spirituality. So, you know, as you mature, as you age, your focus expands to include, you know, like when you're younger, it's just you. But then when you have kids, it's like, well, you could sacrifice for them or, or, or you care about them almost as if they were yours. Uh, you, I mean, as if they were an arm or a leg. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, a, it's sort of a definition of self that expands. And so mm-hmm. I think that as a therapist, you know, the, the better therapists are the ones who uh, define themselves in some ways you know, in terms of their clientele as well. Like, mm. you know, like the welfare of the people they work with is a definitional, has a definitional impact on themselves. What kind of person am I? What kind of therapist am I? Kind of, who am I? What, what's important to me? Is the welfare of, 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 of my clients, you know, important to me? Is my, the planet, you know, the society is all the future, longer term mm-hmm. perspective, even after I die? Not just mm-hmm. because of my own children, but you know the planet and society and how we go forward. Yeah, how does uh, the psychedelics play a role in your practice, your current practice? You don't do psychedelic therapy, correct? That's correct. Yeah, I, you know, I, I work toward that, and I wish mm-hmm. I could do that. Yeah, but you know, I can't really be doing it and you know have a, like a secret practice or something like that, and get on right. stage and write books and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> because eventually, I get into trouble, and I'm kind of right. a wimp. But, you know, I do say, because of the book and other things, you know, my, my um, talks online. Um, by the way, anybody should email me. You can email me at goldsmith.neal, N-E-A-L, at gmail.com. And I, I mean, I like the uh, interaction, and I'll be happy to send you some links. There's lots of stuff of mine online. You know, some of it's better than others, but if you, if you email me, I'll send you good links. Um, so... Um, so I, you know, because of all that activity, I get lots of people coming into my practice who um, are actively involved in taking psychedelics. And while I can't legally, you know, advise them to do it or even recommend it, really, um, I do say, look, if you're going to do it, you, you, you know, I'm enthusiastic about this as a potential therapy. And so, if you um, must take these drugs, <laughs> then try to take it the day before you see me, or make mm-hmm. an appointment with me the day after you do it, because then you're all fresh and opened up. Mm. You know, it's kind of like if you do a psychedelic on a Saturday, then Sunday is the day you want to write your diary, so to speak. Well, you know, if you do it on a Sunday, then come see me on a Monday and I'll be there during the diary writing stage, you know, where you're integrating and questioning and, and dwelling after the experience is over. Um, How do you find so those that, sessions? Is that really helpful? Second. Yeah, I do find them helpful. Um, but, you know, it's not so much like it could be the next day after or the next day after that. It's not like you know, mm-hmm. you know, pant, okay, you know, I got him. He's, you know, almost high. It's not really like that. Exactly. <laughs> it's the, it's not this so much the drug itself as much as the, um, insights and experience, the, um, the, the psychological and emotional experience the person has, uh, while they're having that, that psychedelic experience that opens questions up and changes them. And, you know, uh, that sort of thing that then is what we talk about. It's not so much that they're still high in any way. It's like the after effect. The um, the um, reverberatory, you know, uh, reaction to it. Mm. Um, it's you know, it's people. You know, we, psychedelics are so prominent and exciting and illicit and important and powerful and all those wonderful superlatives. And I do you know agree in general with all those things. And yet, ultimately, it's not the psychedelics that's what's going on here at all. Right. It's really not psychedelics. Is the 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 um is I don't want to say the least important, that would be to denigrate, but certainly not, it, not the foundational issue, not the, not the important thing that's going on. What's going on is what the psychedelics facilitate. What's going on is what the psychedelics illuminate. What's going on is what happens inside of us. Psychedelics don't create that. They don't create any, like, you know, let's say you have this amazing experience about your mother or whatever it may be, something psychological, right? And, or the universe for that matter, something very profound sight and spiritual. Um, well, the, the psychedelics didn't create that thought inside you. They didn't create your mind or your history or your education or anything that contributed to that incredible insight. That insight was in you already mm-hmm. waiting to, you probably already knew it, but certainly the connections were ready to happen. And could happen on their own. Now, psychedelics are a trigger, and they're strong, and they're chemical, and they're they're a mechanical way of triggering insight inside your brain. So, fair enough. People use them, and people have used them for millennia for that purpose, of course. But people have to realize that it's not the trigger 
you know, it's the gun, let's just say, or the bullet, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the psychedelic. It's the thing that it so beautifully shows us in silhouette almost, you know, it's like, it's like a hand in glove. Well, the psychedelics are the glove. What does the hand look like? Mm -hmm. It's that's, it's the, it's the, it's the internal process of, of emergence of your, of your soul, if you will. I spell soul with a small S because I don't want it to be considered a religious concept. I'm not a religious <laughs> person. But soul is a great, a great word because it, 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 if you can de, de religify it and then think about what it is, well, it's the very deepest part of us. Mm. Well, that's a beautiful place to go to, the deepest part below your psychology, below your childhood psychology, to the person wh you were when you were born, before your parents had at you. That perfect essence that we all share, the transpersonal place, mm. is perfect. So going there and touching that is um, realigning. I don't want to say healing because that makes it a medical process, <clears throat> but it's realigning almost like, um, like a sympathetic vibration or alignment coming into harmony, like frequencies come into harmony. It's like aligning with that deeper self that then creates health, happiness, and then health. You know, activity, health is like, you know, behaving properly, behaving way. It's like, you know, the eightfold path, uh, behaving properly. Uh, healthfully. Um, that happens through alignment with what's inside you, the perfection that's within inside you. And that's what psychedelics uh, illuminate and facilitate, but they don't create that process. The process right. is already in you. Mm -hmm. People have it all the time without psychedelics. You don't need a psychedelic to do it. You can have a near-death experience. You can do, you know, sensory overload or sensory deprivation. Now, why would mm -hmm. sensory deprivation and sensory overload both create a sense of, oh my God, I see it clearly I like a psychedelic sort of experience. <laughs> and the reason I think is because both of them are extreme experiences as a psychedelics that are mm -hmm. different from your normal day to day consciousness. When you could be forgiven for not noticing that you have a consciousness, mm -hmm. but when you're in sensory deprivation or sensory overload mm -hmm. or psychedelics, you can, you know, more likely notice, Oh shit. Wow. You know, this is really interesting. I got a mind. You start thinking, becoming self-conscious in the neutral sense of the term, in the positive sense of the term. Yeah. I really like how you hi highlight that, um, as that fact that, you know, it's not the psychedelic. Um, because when I first started doing breath work, I went down and didn't think anything of it. And I kept hearing all these stories of like transpersonal experiences. And, you know, I had a near death experience and I had some, um, pretty far out psychedelic experiences, um, in my teenage years or late teenage years. And wh when I went into the breath work session, I relived all of that. And like my mind was just totally blown that, the process of breathing and just closing your eyes and listening to music can facilitate a, a, like a really transpersonal experience. And, um, that's what our, our breathwork teachers say too. He had a conversation with Stan and they both agreed that the fact that, um, their breathwork experiences were very similar to their early LSD experiences. That's, it's not the substance. Um, you know, it, it's inside of us. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to create those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, you know, like um, uh, sensory overload, sensory deprivation, there's um, drumming, chanting, dancing, mm -hmm. mortification of the flesh. Um, you know, there's so many different ways mm -hmm. um, to not just even create a psychedelic type experience. But, you know, just um, to, it's sort of like the netherworld. The, you know, ancients thought of it as like as that the world of, um, of death, the, the, you know, the, the other world was some place that you could go visit. The shamans would take you there if you would. Um, nowadays, we think of it as some place that happens only after you physically die and then you go there. You know, if you think of an afterlife at all. Um, but it's not some place that you can advise you or you can you kind of visit. The membrane is, is firm. It's not, it's not semi-permeable. But the, the, the ancients thought of it more like, you know, more semi-permeable. You would go. And, of course, it's almost like there's been this evolutionary process of developing our frontal lobes, our fingers with the opposable thumb, you know, our eyes with the visual acuity to be able to manipulate and change the world, to extract the value out of the world, to take, you know, um, uh, you know coal and make it into iron and make it into steel or to take you know, opium and make it into morphine and make it into heroin. It's not exactly the way it works, but, you know, <laughs> to extract out the active principle, we're very, very good at that now. And we've ruined the world in a way by doing that. We've provided our own short-term safety, but we've made the long-term viability of the planet come into question. 
So there, there had to be a way to keep yourself from eating everything, you know, from chopping down every tree. And the tribal peoples, they had the same brain as we do, the same frontal lobes. I mean, it wasn't a million years ago. It was 10,000 years ago. So they had, they had the same brains as us, but they periodically visited the netherworld through the use of visionary plants. And that realignment, that, that vibratory realignment, that conceptual, moral and ethical uh, worldview realignment by visiting that perfect beauty, that infinite perfect beauty periodically, kept them from chopping down all the trees. They would pray to the tree and apologize mm-hmm. you know, for chopping, and they'd only take one or only what they needed. So it was a sustainable um, worldview that led to sustainable behaviors like chopping down only one tree. But when we, when we you know, got rid of the last psychedelic um, rites in the West, these were the illusion mysteries in Greece, when Christianity, the Christian onslaught, kind of eliminated all the different psychedelic mysteries, um, then we got you know, essentially Descartes. You know, Rene Descartes right. and the Cartesian split into, you know, you could like, you could go rape the land and charge interest to your neighbors Monday through Saturday, as long as you went to church on Sunday or contributed to the church even better. So, you know, um, that experiment for the last, whatever, 1500 years or a thousand years or something has been, um, you know, uh, proved itself in the long term to be a failure, short term success, long term failure. There's so many things in life that are oppositional between short term and long term. Like candy, you know, it's a short-term good, a long-term bad, or exercise. <laughs> exercise, short-term bad, long-term good. Mm-hmm. So the distinction between short-term and long-term, they're oftentimes opposite from one another, um, is sort of like the, the, one of the hallmarks of maturity is to be able to see, you know, the long-term, not just the, the short-term, the big mm-hmm. picture, not just the immediate uh, self-interest. And um, without psychedelics in our culture, we've kind of, you know, conveniently forgotten about all that stuff to our peril. Global warming, the perfect storm of, of, of water depletion, topsoil depletion, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're learning, I hope, uh, as a people over time. And psychedelics, the reintroduction of psychedelics now into Western society, I say reintroduction, is, um, you know, in a sense, coming full circle back to a tribal perspective. But having gone through the Cartesian split of modernity, the unity that we're now getting back to, the transcendent unity we're getting back to is different than the unity the tribal peoples had before the Cartesian split. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like a spiral. You come up one level and, you know, we get to a neo-pastoralism that's nice and holistic and uh, sustainable, but with our eyes open, Buddhist style this time. Mm, I like that. <laughs> so burning man just ended um i'm thinking about you you were just talking about like tribal societies and how we're coming back to that do you see like these events taking place kind of like a um a recreation of that type of society well sure i guess i mean i'm not 100 percent sure i know that that young people in general you know people in general try to recreate rites of passage Mm-hmm. You know, rites of passage, it's like development is stepwise. It's not like a continuous 45 degree slope. You know, it's like steps, like a stage, stage theory. So, um, you know, there's childhood and then there's adulthood and then there's marriage and then there's parenthood and then there's elderhood and then there's death. And, you know, if you look at tribal societies, frequently those are the stages of life that are the transition between which between, uh, between them is facilitated by rites of passage. Mm-hmm. And the rites of passage are basically rapid deconstruction and reconstruction of your identity and your role in the tribal society, like overnight, with the use of a ritual, a specific date or time, plus the loosening action of a psychedelic substance, of a visionary plant. So the loosening action, you know, in psychedelic therapy, there were two um, types of therapy. One was called psychedelic therapy, and it was the Western, the um, American style approach, which was kind of like the silver bullet cowboy approach of, you know, machoing one big giant psychedelic spiritual dose. You see God and your life has changed forever. <laughs> That's psychedelic therapy, one or, one or a few. Um, the other school of thought was more European, and that was psycholytic. L-Y-T, psycholytic. And it's lytic, lysis, like um, anxiolytic and things like that means loosening, mm. softening or loosening, lessening. 
So um, psycho, uh, psychedelic therapy, psycholytic therapy was meant to, was used in smaller doses more frequently and interspersed with like um, analytical psychotherapy or uh, psychoanalysis, I should say. So um, it was meant to, and then, you know, if you wanted later on, people talked about, well, occasionally you'll still take a big dose and that would be, might be called psychedelic hmm. psychotherapy. But the two ones from the early days were psychedelic, one dose, and psycholytic loosening. So the loosening action was recognized. And in tribal settings, this loosening action was um, used in rites of passage, during rites of passage. Because you think of it this way. Let's say you're a kid and you're 10 years old. And you're like, you know, they're coming to you 10 or 12, right? They're, they're saying, all right, well, it's time for your rite of passage. You're going to become a man, you know. And, but they don't have a rite of passage. They come to you, they say, all right, well, let's, um, come on, come over to the guys. You come to the men now. And you're 10 years old. You're, you're, you're um, the best 10-year-old. You're the best kid there is. You've been doing it for 10 years. You're expert. you got your little spear. You, you, you know, you're practicing, right? So you, you're expert at getting those little cockroaches and little rodents, you know, and you're the biggest, toughest 10-year-old, you know, in the group now. And the adults come and say, come on, come over and be a man. We'll give you a 35-pound spear that weighs half as much as you do, and you, you'll be crummy. You'll be bad at it. But won't it be great? Come on. Come on over. And the kid says, no, no, I'm happy where I am. I'm a strong, happy, successful 10-year-old, man. I don't want to come be a weak little adult. Mm. He'd resist. And, by, you know, if, if, he, if he didn't come over, then by the time he's 16, in the children's realm, he'd be a pretty ridiculous sight, wouldn't he? It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. So instead of trying to convince the child who doesn't want to, you know, look stupid, they just make it a big cultural event, a rite of passage. And they do it with a loosening agent, the, the visionary plant, to make it easier for the child to deconstruct, deconfigure the prior identity. It's sort of like and reconfigure in, in the new role as adult. And in the morning you wake up, well, you're with the guys. And now you're a man. Now, you, you know, you might not be good at it, but you'll get good eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, um, so I think that's the process that goes down. And then as far as rites, you know, rituals and rites of passage in the modern day, I think people do that, you know, anyway. People, the kids do it with raves. You know, it used to be, you know, that sort of thing. Um, dance parties and events. These are, you know, the, the ways that you can, you know, uh, let your childhood go and reconfigure as adults. The problem is, I think, it's not that well, well thought through of a process here. Um, it's, not, it's not based on thousands of years of, of trial and error. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, and it's re regulated and illegal and, you know, it's, it's illicit. And who are your role models? Um, you know, are they the, the most successful people in your society? Are they the authority figures? Well, not really. Um, you know, so it, it's marginalized. And um, so the illegality with drugs causes almost all the problems with drugs. I mean, there, there's always been drugs or, or, you know, psychoactive substances in all cultures in, in the past. So, you know, why is it such a problem here with addiction, and arrests and disease and everything? And mostly it's because it's illegal. Because mm -hmm. if they were legal and regulated, I don't mean legal and freely available. I mean legal, regulated, both in their manufacture and their distribution, some kind of regulation. It doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of regulation. But everything, look, scuba diving requires certification. <laughs> um, life-saving, senior life-saving requires certification. CPR requires certification. Driving a car requires certification. Uh, skydiving, every damn thing that's dangerous in society is allowed to be done with appropriate training, supervision, regulation, you know, licensure, whatever. You can't mm -hmm. be a brain surgeon without getting licensed, you know, trained. So this is, there's a process that's more or less fits the danger level. To make these activities possible to do in society in a relatively safe way. So that's the same thing with psychedelics, of course. You know, it, the reason why we have all the problems with drugs is because they're illegal. And people who use them anyway, like, for example, for rites of passage or for other reasons, for spiritual development, people are going to use these substances whether you make them legal or not. But if they're illegal, then you've put them in the realm of, you know, uh, you know, uh, coat hanger abortions. I mean, you know, it's like the same sort of thing. It obviously, it, the public policy should be harm reduction. What, mm. you know, on a global level you, produces the least harm to society. And certainly, you know, prohibition is not that, especially not with psychedelics. Um, because, you know, there's, there's uh, harm reduction approaches to, to drugs that cause harm. But then there's also benefit enhancement you know, approaches to drugs that do well. 
that we should make them more available. Psychedelics is a great example of that. And since the research has been going so beautifully at the medical schools, you know, in the next uh, five or 10 years, both psilocybin, the active ingredient in mushrooms, and MDMA, the active ingredient in molly or ecstasy, um, will be rescheduled. And when they're rescheduled, that will change everything. Uh, not just individuals, therapy practice and things like that, but uh, not just prohibition and the ills that come from that, but society, the, the society as a whole, our maturity as a society will change um, over time as well. It's a wonderful thing um, that we are, in, you know, reintroducing psychedelics into into Western civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a cool transition into this next question about. How, I'm sure you get asked all the time, but how do you suggest people get involved in the psychedelic world if they if they want to get more involved professionally or uh, as yeah. a volunteer well, I or something? Two things, right? You, you, it's perfect. I'm so glad you asked the question. First of all, as far as like you know, volunteering and stuff, the organization that I recommend people to go look at is Maps the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. I don't work for them. I've never worked for them, actually. But I work with them many times. I've, I've hosted their events, and I've emceed their conferences and different things like that. And I've worked with Rick Doblin, the founder, in a different uh, number of different ways. I've known him for many years, and the group is wonderful. When I first, when I got reached, you know, midlife and I was leaving corporate and going you know, eventually into psychedelics work um, I, 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 it wasn't like when I was in college and I didn't really read anything you know I just listened to my dorm mates and tried LSD but after you know a 19 year hiatus when I tried it again when I was in my early 40s and I started looking around I read everything I could find and I looked at organizations what was available online and MAPS was one of them that appealed to me because MAPS is or oriented toward research and policy but mm -hmm. not only research and policy which are my interests of course but also, they believe in changing society and opening up the culture to embracing psychedelics and using them not just medicinally, but recreationally as well as appropriate. And so MAPS is involved with um, uh, goes to Burning Man, for example, and they have a Zendo project to help people who have had too much psychedelics at, at, at Burning Man. There's also the Boom Festival in Portugal where drugs are legal. And at the Boom Festival, MAPS offers psychedelic uh, therapy type sessions legally. Hmm. at the Boom Festival. So MAPS is involved in social activism when they can and when appropriate as well. So I love that organization. It's uh, MAPS.org and you know they'll tell you all about the drugs. You can go to MAPS.org slash research, I think it is, and you can look up the different drugs and all the research that have been done. Um, but that's a wonderful place to get involved. Another place for great information is the Arrowid site, E-R-O-W-I-D. The Arrowids, uh, Fire and Earth Arrowid, are a couple that founded this basically encyclopedic knowledge base and they're very rigorous about the um, quality of, of what they put up. Now, there's also talk uh, areas where people chat about, you know, how stoned they got last weekend. And those guys <laughs> I would personally uh, avoid because they tend, they're, they're just, you know, ends of one. You know, there's only one subject in that research study. And also they tend to have poly drug use, you know, during the experience. So you can't really tell the effect of one drug or another since they usually use more than one. But the Arrowhead write-ups, the staff write-ups, are excellent. In fact, the government people look to Arrowhead for good information about, about these drugs. So Arrowhead's a great site as well. Now that's in terms of, you know, like volunteering for maps or getting good information from Arrowhead. Um, uh, as far as professional is concerned, um, I'm asked a lot, of, a lot by young people, you know, people who are leaving, you know, seniors in college or, you know, that kind of thing, or they say, well, I'm afraid to apply to medical school and, uh, you know, come out of the closet, so to speak, about my interest in psychedelics, because I'm afraid that it's going to um, harm me, that somebody's going to be prejudiced against this field of study because, there's, you know, it's obviously illicit and blah, blah, blah. And um, first of all, I think that's not an accurate depiction of the world anymore. Although clearly there's people who are prejudiced and biased. It's true. But look, when you have the best, you know, psychedelics research program in the world at Johns Hopkins, and you have psychedelics research at NYU and Harvard and UCLA and, you know, University of Zurich, for that matter, and Miami, University of Miami. There's different places. Um, University of Arizona. There's lots. San Francisco is another one. There's lots of, um, not enough, but there's a, a chunk of psychedelics research going on, five or ten, you know, sites, locations in America. Um, and, and they're all good. And they're all medical schools. And they're all top schools. The ones I mentioned are all top schools. So, um, you know, it's like I say to these people, listen, the, the key to your success as a psychedelics uh, professional researcher is excellence. If you get straight A's, 
then, you know, if Harvard won't take you, then Yale will. You know, don't worry if you get straight A's. And, you know, be the colleague that your professors want to hang out with. You know, professionally, I mean, not just drinking beers, but that too, for that matter, actually. Um, and be a mature professional. Um, uh, Nishay Davenport is, a, is an example of mm. someone who, as a graduate student, was a, was a mature professional and really took a, a you know, a, a, a full-fledged professorial type of role even before she was actually out of, with her PhD. Um, but I, I say, don't, don't be scared, be excellent. Um, if you, and, and you know, if, if, if Harvard does turn you down and you know, Yale might accept you, you say to Harvard, well, gee, that's too bad because, you know, I have a $500,000 young professionals grant from the national science foundation with me. And then Harvard says, oh, well, guess what? You know, we just figured out a way to accept you into our program <laughs> after all, because excellence and money talk. And so I don't mean to be crude exactly, but, um, you know, coming from a, a good institution with great grades, you can write your own ticket. And, um, uh, and then, um, uh, also, uh, she's, you know, it, it's like, um, uh, what kind of work do you want to do? In other words, people say to me, well, do you want to be a researcher? I ask them, do you want to be a therapist? Um, if you want to be a therapist, well, what kind of therapist do you want to be? A, um, you want to lead a big, you know, medical school based research project and do psychotherapy as well. And do psychedelic therapy because in five years or 10 years, it's going to be legal to do that. Is that what you want to do? Well, then you're going to have to, do you want to, um, then you're going to have to go through, you know, formal institution, the best schools, et cetera. You want to be, all right, well, you don't want to do that, but you want to be private practice. Fine. Do you want to be, um, you want to get insurance reimbursement or don't you care? Are you, in other words, are you in the system? Are you on the grid or not? And if not, then what kind of work, where do you want to go to school? So if you want to be, if you want to get insurance reimbursement, if you want to be sort of a traditional psychotherapist, so to speak, then you have to be licensed. To be licensed, you have to go to an accredited school and pass, you know, the licensure exam and that sort of thing. If you don't care about that, if you're kind of a hippie and you just want to help others and you don't really care about insurance, then you don't need to be licensed. You don't need to go to accredited school. Then you can go to a place that's kind of less accredited, like Naropa, for example, mm. or um, CIIS the California Institute for Integral Studies. Those guys are all, I actually have, I shouldn't speak because I haven't, you know, researched them recently, but they've been, you know, partially accredited in certain ways or by the state, but, you know, so they may be fully accredited by now. Again, I don't want to talk them down, but there's different schools that are less formal. And then you may not even want to go to school. I don't recommend it, but there's lots of ways to be an underground therapist. People do it all the time. Again, I don't recommend it, but the fit, it's got to be a fit, I think, to what your disposition is and what your goals are. And so there's all different answers to how do you get involved with the psychedelics world professionally, depending on, you know, what kind of work you want to end up doing, research or therapy, what have you, and what your value system is and worldview is. So, you know, I talk to people like that and try to help young people all the time. Um, but the one thing I don't think people should worried about is should be worried about is um, uh, their professors. You know, uh, looking down on them. That's, that's I think. Look, if your professor looks down on you, then you don't hang out with that professor because <laughs> there'll be other professors at your school who are familiar with or you know respectful of. There's a lot of wonderful research going down, and it's going and it's being reported in in New York Times and everywhere else, and you know in big articles everywhere. So if, if, if the person you're dealing with, the professor or mentor advisor is um, prejudiced against psychedelic research, it strikes me that they're not really all that sophisticated or not really the kind of person you might want to work with. Why are you working with that person? Actually, it would be sort of my next question. And also be strategic, you know, like go um, uh, before you apply to the school, you look at all the pressures in the psych department. Do a Google search on them. Try to figure out uh, or a Google scholar, you know, try to figure out what they've published. Did they write some article on psychedelics, you know, when they were younger, for example? Or is there any uh, professor at that university who did? Who are mm -hmm. your allies? And um, who were you up against when you're putting in an application? Try to find a mentor before you ever apply. Someone who will sponsor you uh, because of your interest in psychedelics, for example. Mm -hmm. there, and, of course, the universities that are already doing psychedelics research are probably easier targets in a way because – you know, they've already had that experience of working with people who are doing psychedelics research. Right. Wow. That's, that's a lot of great information right there. Um, I had a question. Cool. Uh, you just mentioned something about coming out of the closet with the psychedelic. Uh, I, I'm wondering as a young professional, like say a therapist who is going down a licensure route, should they worry at all about coming out of the closet with like past use or their interest or, you know, anything like that? Well, 
personal use is I- illegal. I mean, you can't be arrested for um, something you did in the past. Right. You know, so the, uh, that's not a problem. But you can be looked down upon, I guess, for mm-hmm. having done something that's illegal. And I don't know if, like, I don't know, actually, the attorney could advise you better whether licensure process, which used to involve, you know, in the 50s, when there was blacklist for people who were leftists or communists, people would get denied licensure. They couldn't pass the law review, you know, the law um, boards uh, for that reason. There was, it was considered, I guess, what, a bad character or something like that. And so I'm not sure if any of those things still apply, if those are still in place at all. I'm honestly not up on that. So I'm not a thousand percent sure whether somebody could hold it in some concrete way, hold it against you that you had committed an illegal act when you were younger. Right. Uh, I, I don't think so. And I think, once again, I think the world's much more sophisticated than that now. I, I've never heard of a case where somebody being somebody was denied licensure because a license because of, of something like that. Um, I, I just I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit like you know uh, rose colored glasses a bit, perhaps. <laughs> but but I don't think so really. I think though that I think it's a different world these days. I don't. I think you could sue them. I mean you know I, I don't know. I, I just don't think that that's relevant. First of all, and if it is relevant, it's relevant in many ways in the positive. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if they if they denied everybody who came out of the closet about having taken a psychedelic. Uh, if they denied licensure, then nobody would get licensed in California. Right. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure that that's, that's an issue, but again, I'm not, I'm not literally, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I guess it's something to maybe, you know, for the young professionals out there to look into, um, you know, cause I, you know, I've heard some of your talks and whatnot and you seem pretty open about some past experiences. Um, and I just always yeah. kind of wondered like, you know, how is, talking about past experiences as a professional, like ever get looked down upon with colleagues or anything like that? Well, no, I mean, um, I think once again, it's a self-selection process. First of all, as far as licensure is concerned, I don't, I can't imagine that anybody would do a search on you. Right. Google search for whatever to check your, <laughs> your posts on Facebook or something before they awarded, you know, awarded you the license. I don't think they do that. I don't think they review your character. I think they just, you pass the test and you get your license. And so mm-hmm. I don't think anybody does any research on that. Actually, the, my, my fear for, in comparing it to the 50s, now that I think about it, it's probably pretty ridiculous. I don't think <laughs> they take the time to do that. I don't think anybody does that. I think they could sue you, by the way, because it's so judgmental and arbitrary in a way. So I don't think that uh, anybody, uh, any licensure board would consider. I just don't. So I don't think that's an issue. Um, uh Say again, please. Uh, just uh, like, you know, some of your lectures, you know, you've talked about past experiences and I was just wondering, like, um, you know, has there... Well, I don't have to worry about licensure. You asked me about colleagues, right? I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, look, you know, um, uh, the colleagues love me. I don't know what to say. I mean, the work <laughs> I do... Look, people, you know, I'm, I'm prominent in the psychedelics, you know, you know, that's prominently an interest of mine. It's true. But I don't, I don't think that, you know, um, I think the, the bigger value that I offer people that people take from me, I think, is my, my philosophies and my worldview and my, my personality theory and my psychotherapy mm-hmm. approaches. Those things which are informed by my psychedelics use, grounded by, opened by, warmed by, you know, any number of wonderful processes that come from psychedelics that help me in my worldview and my practice and everything. Nonetheless, it's the worldview and the practices that are what are, you know, what people like. It's, it's not, you know, specifically my advocacy or my, my interest in psychedelics. It's when I talk about, you know, today, as we've been talking, there were a few times when you said to me, wow, that's really, I don't know what you said, that was really good or something like that. It wasn't a psychedelic point that I was making usually. It was a point about motherhood or childhood or psych- you know, personality being a defense mechanism. Or, it was those sorts of points which right. admittedly in me came in part, not just from psychedelics though, because I'm widely read. I, you know, come from this background. I, I have this, you know, these interests. I've read a lot over the decades before I ever started taking psychedelics again. So it's a lot of influence, the total of the totality of me that makes it. But again, it's not the psychedelics per se or the knowledge about psychedelics. Lots of people knowledge about psychedelics. The thing that I bring strongly to the table is my, my perspective or worldview or psych- psychotherapy and, a personality theory and things like that. Mm-hmm. 
So, and the colleagues love that and the clients love that. And, you know, people, you know, I, 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 I get, you know, it's funny. I, you know, <laughs> when you, when you hear, you know, from religious people in the past and they say, they say, and somebody says, oh, you're so great. And they say, well, no, I'm just, I'm just a conduit. I'm just a voice for God, you know, to speak, you know, through me. And they're very humble about it and everything. And, you know, I, I don't certainly take on that perspective. But I do feel, though, that, you know, to the extent that I, people say, wow, that theory was wonderful and that, that statement you made was really right on. The, the, I don't, in a way, take credit for it in a way, because all I'm doing is seeing the reality, seeing what's out there and reporting it back. It's not me that created the fact that things are beautiful and whole, and it's not me that created the fact that safety and love is the foundation of things. I'm just noticing it and telling you about it. But the beauty, the beautiful things I'm describing are for me, they're the way the world works. So, you know, it, it's, it's cool to be able to see it and to share it. Um, but I didn't make it up. I didn't create it. Um, right. <laughs> I'm just, see, you know, just seeing it and reporting. Uh, so anyway, so, so it turns out to be good stuff because it's grounded in, in psychedelics and maturity, whatever it is, you know, how it worked out. Um, the book was well received. People, you know, I get, I still get email on that book, you know, mm -hmm. people telling me that it changed their lives, that, you know, big, important, you know, wonderful things to hear and my colleagues too. So I don't think to say, you know, maybe look, if I went to, I don't know where would be a, a bastion of conservative, conservative, conservativeness today someplace in, I don't know, middle America, maybe, or who knows what, someplace like that, then maybe I would be looked askance at perhaps. But I, you know, I didn't even think that. I think nowadays everybody gets the New York Times, everybody's online and there'd be professors all over the place. If I gave a talk at some conservative university in, in the middle of America, you know, I'm sure that I would get mobbed, not mobbed, but approached by, by students and professors afterward, hungry for that kind of information and, and very complimentary and happy to have heard what I had to say even though there might be, yes, some old timers who were more conservative um, or resistant or negative on it. So, you know, my, my experience has not been negative at all uh, in mm -hmm. terms of, and I've been working in this world since, I don't know, the late eighties, 1980s, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, mid, no, no, not that early since the mid nineties, actually, I sort of, in the way came out of the closet around then. And uh, since that time, so that's like, you know, it's like at least 20, 25 years. Um, and that was the earlier days when things weren't quite so well publicized or well received. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, I remember one time somebody I admired said to me, um, uh, uh, why would you give a psychedelic to a mental patient? It makes you crazy. Why would you give it to a mental patient? And it was a great question and it mm -hmm. precipitated a wonderful conversation. And, um, you know, uh, that's so, so, you know, the, the, even the skepticism is, is good. Um, over time, people, you know, can come to understand why psychedelics are of interest. In a way, you know, it, it, there's not that many questions that are more interesting than psychedelics. Right. Maybe, um, <laughs> you know, neurosurgery or cosmology or, um, you know, does God exist or is there an afterlife or you know, this is a big, big, big question, issue, yeah. area for focus. It's big and it's important and it's profound, not just for us personally or for psychotherapy, but for society and, and the, the future of the, of the planet. You know, this, it's, this is a big one. Psychedelics is a really big issue and I'm proud to be affiliated with it in any way. Mm. It's the best thing I ever did other than have a child. <laughs> be a father. Be a father was, was more important, but is the, most, the single most important. And that, even that view comes from psychedelics. The fact that mm -hmm. I view my, my being a father as the most important thing really, you know, I think I, I, I had my son when I was first getting back into psychedelics again. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Very beautiful. So Neil, do, do you have any speculations on where psychedelic research might go 15, 30 years from now? Um, well, you know, I, there's certain things I'm interested in that I'm sure others are. First of all, there's, um, you know, Sasha Shulgin created, uh, cataloged really in the book, um, Pikal, 279 phenethylamines, phenethylamines, um, psychedelic, uh, psycho, most of them were psychedelic, psychoactive, um, uh, methoxylated amphetamines. And, um, 
he created most of them, you know, by tweaking, uh, you know, the spine of something and adding uh, a branch onto it of something else that might be interesting because of its activity in some other uh, chemical. So you know how it, how he did that. So oh, eventually, we're going to have to do that with all possible chemicals, right? In other possible in the in the sense not just which can be created molecularly, but which can be created and fit into our um, receptor sites, like a, like a plug into a, into a socket. So there's only so many uh, potential chemicals that you can create that are that are that have a structure activity relationship, where the the, the structure of the, of the chemical fitting into the neurotran into the receptor site triggers the release of, of a signal. Well, you know, there's only so many structures that can do that. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands. There's thousands, I'm sure. How many thousands? Sasha created 279. How many are there? 10,000? I have zero idea. But there, are, there is a limited number, and a computer could, could model, you know, how many. Um, and to do that, we have to figure out what the receptor sites are structured like. They're still discovering new serotonin sub-receptor sub sites. Uh, I think there's... 17 now sub serotonin sub sites. So anyway, so it's very complicated. And uh, so they'll figure that out eventually, uh, not in 30 years, but over time. And then, um, you know, the way these things work together, you can think of them like almost like a, a huge church organ. You know how a church organ has more than uh, one keyboard. Yeah. So let's say you have a keyboard for the serotonin system and you have a keyboard for the dopamine system and you have a keyboard for the norepinephrine system. And you have a keyboard for the choline system. And the keyboards, the white keys are the agonists, the thing that make it happen more. And the black keys are the antagonists, the thing that decrease the action of the neurotransmitter. And imagine you have a chord, some white keys, some black keys. That's the way. Mm. So LSD, you have this big chord on the serotonin system fitting into the, uh, the serotonin site and mucking with it. Some things black keys, some things white keys, some things repressed, some things in, in, in increased. But there's also a little bit of um, dopamine going on, even with LSD. It's a minor chord. It's slower, softer, but it's mm. also playing. So like a church organ, you have these different neurotransmitters going. And so when you have um, MDMA, which is a phenethylamine, it's, it's a lot of serotonin, but a lot of norepinephrine also. A lot of, it's, it's speedy, it's a, it's a methoxylated amphetamine. So you have a lot of that and a lot of dopamine too, because it's a little bit addictive, very pleasure oriented. Marijuana, serotonin and dopamine. So it's a mixture of all these chords. So they figure that out as well. What things go, and then as I said earlier, you know, what therapies, what's in this case, we're talking psychedelics, what psychedelic therapies are appropriate for what uh, disorders or what, you know, even proactively, what spiritual development, what, what positive things. As a, from a nootropic perspective, what's going to make you better, enhance you. So to figure out all of that stuff, um, you know, uh, I wish they'd do some more research on ayahuasca. They, they don't do research on mixtures because you know, it's not <laughs> chemistry, chemically pristine. You want to do it on a single chemical. And so, that, you know, that's very important at the beginning to choose a specific chemical and keep it clean. But over time, they'll do research on ayahuasca, on, on admixtures. They'll do research on, you know, they'll do that. I'd like to see a study done on the menstrual cycle in psychedelics. Hmm. Nobody's ever done a, re a research project on that. That's just my own personal, you know, interest, you know, curiosity. Um, so, yeah. They'll do more psychotherapy stuff. Right now, they're, they're doing work with the dying, with, um, with uh, rape victims and post-traumatic stress disorder in returning veterans. The things that are traumatic, tragic, life-destroying um, uh, effects. Dying is you know, an existential issue. Um, and so uh, why? Because those were the first application areas to apply for because these were the ones that where traditional treatments had not worked. And um, the um, pain and suffering, you know, you, you should try anything. You can't really restrict an experimental treatment to people who are dying or for people who, for whom other treatments have not worked. So they went for the most extreme things. But over time, they'll branch out into other application areas. There's so many. Um, there's uh, uh, autism. That's being actually started on already using um, MDMA with autism. I think, I think it's MDMA she's using. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, Alicia Danforth at UCLA. Um, mm -hmm. 
there's there's so much so many application areas. There's alcoholism. There's uh, work with the dying, of course. There's couples work. There's um, uh, there's I'm looking. I have a, a list somewhere. I'm trying to find. But you know, there's so many different applications. Alcoholism, various um, um, addictions, substance abuse. Uh, I think uh, they should do a research program um, using uh, uh, Buddhist monks, Buddhist uh, adepts, as um, because after all, they have a map, you know, um, of the uh, cartography of consciousness already worked out, and they're used to going inside and meditating. And wouldn't it be interesting to have Buddhists? Uh, be the uh, subjects, not just, there's an actually, there's a very interesting study going on now called the, um, it's the religious leaders study. And it's a joint uh, study between NYU psilocybin project and the Johns Hopkins psilocybin project. And they're providing psilocybin to um, uh, religious leaders. These are heads of, tr- of congregations, people who are, um, you know, priests, rabbis, ministers, they're fairly strict, you know, conservative about how they're defining things. There's no shamanistic approaches represented, for example. Um, but they are giving these to people who've never had a psychedelic experience before. So um, they want to see whether what kind of experience they have. And the people at, um, uh, at Johns Hopkins already demonstrated in their very first research project how psychedelics can create a mystical type, they called it a mystical type experience. Um, so that's pretty well established already for, you know, there's a lot of research establishing that, but, um, but now they're doing this, uh, religious leader study. So, uh, the, you know, that's another avenue right now. Um, the spiritual approach to psychedelics, you know, hasn't really been, is now actually being looked at in medical schools and most prominently Johns Hopkins, but pretty much there's been a division between the spiritual approach like ayahuasca and that's, you know, been approved, uh, been, um, in Supreme court cases recently. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> And then the medical approach with people who are sick, you know, so the overlap between the, that duality, if you will, um, where you look at, you know, spiritual development as, a, you know, a, a, a healthful, proactive thing to do um, uh, is is beginning to emerge as an approach. So eventually, I think, you know, they'll be using psychedelics to train divinity students. Uh, they'll be using psychedelics in rites of active rites of passage, like for teenagers eventually, like the bar mitzvah will become eventually an active um, uh, psychedelic uh, rite of passage. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a natural. It, it, it was originally and will be again. Cool. Mm-hmm. So the theme I'm hearing is just kind of like filling out. Right now, we have a very bare skeleton, or at least we have a bare skeleton um, as it goes for the last decade or so of research and filling out all the rest of it. Um, yeah. Because there's a lot right. that, that we kind of, you know, in a sense, know that works, uh, but we have to well, kind of prove it. It's important not to, to prove, yes, to in the positive but also to avoid the negative. Yeah. You know, the more research that's done, the more people that use psychedelics, the more ayahuasca ceremonies there are, the more opportunity there is for untoward results, for tragedy, for stupid people doing stupid things and having disastrous results that, that get a lot of news play. The, you know, the, the likelihood that there could be a backlash in the psychedelics research realm is significantly more than zero. Right. To quote my friend, my friend Bob Jesse. So, um, you know, it, it, we have to still, you know, um, uh, be, be mature, I think is again, the key word. Um, and not, uh, and, and I think the process of unfolding these substances back in society needs to be, um, carefully done, not, um, just, you know, like opened up. I think there needs to be thoughtfulness. I think there needs to be commissions and meetings and groups and guidelines developed. And there hasn't been a lot of that already done in a systematic way. Um, I think the government should fund research on how to do that, Mm. uh, on how how to introduce this, reintroduce this substance into society without having society go crazy. Uh, Not literally, I don't mean that. I mean, go wild and use it in immature ways that are not going to serve us. Cool. Well, Neil, I think that's a good place to stop for right now. Um, can, okay. you, can you say one more time your your website? Sure. It's uh, <clears throat> well, the website is neilgoldsmith.com, and the email is goldsmith.neil at gmail.com. But um, I suggest you know if you if you message me, I'll send you some links, 
And uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Connect to me through um, email. You can also link to me, you know, through the website. The website, however, is my psychotherapy website. If you want to see some more psychedelic links, you can go to um, neilgoldsmith.com, and that's N-E-A-L, N-E-A-L, goldsmith.com, um, slash, re- slash psychedelics. Awesome. Right. We'll link that up. Links. Fantastic, Neil. I right. appreciate it. Yeah, thank right. you so much. Really great talking to you. Yeah, Good questions. Right. Thanks for asking them. <laughs> yeah, pleasure. Take care.